I was born in 1987, and though Albuquerque is my hometown, I never knew the Albuquerque Civic Auditorium, until 2015. My wife, co-founder of Modern Albuquerque, became obsessed with finding it. After seeing a postcard online, she thought she could simply venture out into the city and locate it. She couldn't. The postcard was uncaptioned, and at first, neither of us knew what we were looking for. Where does something like this go? What happened to it? It was only after Albuquerque historian Mo Palmer told us what we'd seen did I find out that the Albuquerque Civic Auditorium, pictured here, was no more. I'm here today to tell you its story. Not the story of the hundreds of events that took place under the dome, but of the dome itself, beginning and end. And through the magic of magnetic tape, parts of this tale will also be told by architect George Clayton Pearl. We begin in 1955. The idea for a municipal auditorium had been stuck in the planning stages for 20 years. A building was designed to go on the university campus, but the bond issue that was meant to provide funding for it was challenged and progress abruptly stopped after the footings were poured. Mary Ferguson, wife of Gordon Ferguson, the founding principal of the architectural firm Ferguson, Stevens & Associates, had been diligently cutting out every newspaper article about the building for years now. Her husband held the contract for designing the theater-type auditorium to be located on the campus. The off-again, on-again project consumed a lot of ink, and she must have grown tired of tracking it, because when his daughter Fer Suki Ferguson showed me her scrapbook, there were more articles piled inside than neatly taped to its pages. The mere mention of an auditorium had become a running joke in the city. In 1953, APS Superintendent Milne quipped to a group of teachers attending a convention here that we hope to have a civic auditorium for you next year. Emboldened by the howls of laughter, he continued, Of course, there are still some technical things yet to be ironed out, but I can assure you of this. Completion of the auditorium is 20 years closer than when I first mentioned it. Papers called the auditorium issue a jinx, but finally there was progress. A previously rejected site was selected and appraised. An 18-acre lot situated north of St. Joseph Hospital, due west from where the I-25 freeway was slated to be built. In total, 21 sites had been considered. The freeway's route is pictured on the site plan, drawings housed at the Center for Southwest Research. We know that the project team knew how close it would pass to the auditorium. For perspective, we can see both the auditorium and the freeway completed in this footage, and the, and the distance the site was from downtown. The base budget for the 83,710 square foot building was $1 million. Electrical and mechanical added another 355000 Perhaps because of its history, the project was fast-tracked. Bob Mallory told me that it is always in an to an architect's advantage to do his work as fast as possible. Perhaps, in the case of the auditorium, doubly so. City Commission Chairman and Champion of the project, Maurice Sanchez, told the newspaper that the city should have an auditorium by the fall of 1956. Architect Gordon Ferguson held on to the contract for the auditorium, and despite the change in venue, Ferguson, Stevens, and Associates stayed on as the architectural firm making the structure multi-purpose. Don Stevens, Ferguson's partner, hadn't been much involved in these early dealings. Stevens had just moved to the state when the office first received the contract, and he hadn't yet been licensed to practice here. Everything was done under Gordon's name, he recalled. In their office, George Clayton Pearl worked as the lead designer and Bob Mallory as chief draftsman. Another future partner, Robert Campbell, then an architecture student at the nearby University of New Mexico, ran the blueprints and recalled that he was allowed to contribute a small detail to the drawings, the counter for the coat check. On the engineering end, Fred Fricke worked as the project's structural engineer and Dr. Marcello Giomi on mechanical. Consulting structural engineer Sergio Acosta also had a role on the project. The Civic Auditorium appears in his job list. George Pearl produced the design for the structure and in an undated presentation recalled visiting the site. These are his words. 
As I spent more and more time on the site, the sand hills started to look like low domes. Concrete cost much less than structural steel. The problem with concrete was the cost of the formwork. Now, if I could find a way to simplify the forming. When I first mentioned shaping one of the sand hills and pouring a thin shell concrete dome on earth, Gordon Ferguson, who was in charge of the project, did not take the suggestion seriously. But the next day he said, that boy may have just stumbled onto something. According to Pearl, it was difficult to even walk the site, and a tremendous amount of earth moving would need to be done. As we understand it, Gordon thought to approach the dome's construction by forming it over earth and then lifting it into place. However, it was Pearl who recalled the story about the Spanish mission San Javier de Bac, a legend that the raised dome was constructed over a mound of earth that the clergy buried the church's riches under to give the parish incentive to dig the dirt away again. The architectural plans were presented in April 1955 and approved the following month. The land was acquired and the contractor, Lemke, Clow, and King, hired in August. Once a permit was issued, earth moving at the site commenced. By the fall of 1955, the preparations of the site for construction were underway. Other buildings were to follow as the city considered making the area into a civic center, plans that would go unrealized. These early renderings from the office of SMPC Architects, formerly Ferguson Stevens and Associates, and renamed for principal architects Don Stevens, Bob Mallory, George Pearl, and Robert Campbell, illustrate George Pearl working out the program. Pearl was collaborative and worked with his colleagues and clients on the design. In another undated presentation, he said, I try never to speak of buildings I have designed, because, except for my own houses and such, I have not designed any buildings. We, however, the partners and our staff, the consultants and the builders, and the clients, have designed buildings. Instead of a theater-type auditorium that had been drawn up for the university campus site, this location would house an arena-type auditorium, in the round. Flexibility, rather than acoustic perfection, was its goal. The circular arena could be divided for performances with a curtain and a temporary stage. At maximum capacity, the auditorium could hold 6,000 people, with 3,700 fixed balcony seats and room for 2,300 portable seats on the floor. Described in the paper as following the modernist trend, the architectural design approach was also cost efficient. Sand and dirt on the site could be allocated to the building process of forming a dome, sparing the expense of scaffolding. The project was widely publicized, the process well documented. A last effort to stop the construction, alleging that the contract for the construction was illegal because the cost was more than the amount of the auditorium bond fund and charging that the site was undesirable, inadequate, and unsuited for an auditorium, and that taxpayers would suffer irreparable harm if the auditorium was constructed, was dismissed by a judge. Construction had continued through the hearings. A series of photographs located by Diane Schaller of Historic Albuquerque Incorporated show the construction site and reveal key details of how the dome was formed. The saying goes that a photograph is worth a thousand words. And if this is the case, what value might we assign to a moving image? What you're about to see are excerpts from a reel of home movies recorded by Dr. Lawrence H. Wilkinson. Wilkinson practiced medicine at the nearby St. Joseph Hospital and recorded many of these shots from its roof. First, a trench was dug for the pouring of footings and columns, and the excavated dirt pushed into a central mound. The auditorium's iconic dome was made by pouring concrete over the shaped mound of earth, then excavating the area beneath it to the arena's floor level. The 
You may notice a lack of barriers around the construction area in this footage. Bob Mallory did not remember a fence. In fact, he brought his son to visit the construction site with him, something that Carmen Acosta, daughter of Sergio, recalls as well. She and her brother were positioned in front of the building, not for a sweet family photo, but for scale. But we have seen at least one photograph of a family enjoying a picnic atop the under construction dome. The concrete dome, five inches thick at its peak and two feet thick at its ed edges, was held together with wire wrapped around a groove in the dome's edge a reported 860 times, and then tightened. Don Stevens described it this way, If you can picture a saucer with a big, thick rim on it, and you push on the saucer, the rim holds the saucer together. The wrapped wire created a terrific pressure bind that held the dome together. The cabling technique is known as Wren's Chain, after Sir Christopher Wren, who used iron chain at St. Paul's Cathedral in London to contain the outward thrust forces at the base of the church's dome. 